<clears throat> Welcome everyone to the LinkedIn Power Lab webinar. Today is the 20th of December 21. So this is the last one for this year and actually also the second year where I present about nearly every month at the beginning, even twice per month, everything around LinkedIn. So in this time, the topic is called Find Your Tribe with LinkedIn. So I prepared, as usual, for this, the topic within three little subtopics. So first of all, those who don't know me yet. So my name is Gunnar, which is Swedish. I came from Switzerland five years ago to Sydney. I'm blogging about social selling, which also got me my, uh, my profession in the meantime, which is good. I created two online courses, nearly three, and I published a couple of books. So then what I would like to do also that we can use the chat. I have a couple of questions to you because I would like to get it in an engaging way. Anyone have a guess where I'm sitting at this um, in this colorful room here? Maybe a, health, a health food shop. Mm. It's a little cafe in the design of the 50s in Lura in the Blue Mountains. So then mm. so we can get out a bit in the meantime. So but let's concentrate on the content. So the topic today, find your tribe. You could also say find your network or your supporters, but I simply say tribe because it has some kind of magnetic feeling so that you can get your people around you instead of only staying somewhere at the very end. So I put it into three subtopics. First of all is focusing on the niche or niche, depending how you would pronounce that word. The second one here would be find your tribe. And that's an important thing as well. You can, it's not just about searching, but finding. And the third one then is follow up in your style. And those of you who attended some of my webinars, you know my passion for three times the same letter. So it couldn't be searched, it had to be find. And uh, actually that's also what we would like to have. So to get started, so each of these Three topics have one question to you in the chat and five slides. So then to give it a bit of a structure. So let's look into focusing. Question to you. I'm thinking about small businesses that most of us, some are related to our entrepreneurs. So I ask in the chat, do you compare your offering to the market in your niche? That means in general, not only on social media. Do you really compare what you have to the market in your niche? So this means for those who are singers in New Zealand, do you really compare how other singers are visible or those who are in the beauty industry? Do you look in how others provide these offerings? Anyone doing this? Rachel? Yes, yes. Very good. And I think even, even, even Trevor, you also surely compare because that's what we discussed years ago. Uh, that you have a good market understanding, but not everyone does it in a very comprehensive way. And the tricky thing is, if you want to do that, you need to have some kind of systematic approach to really focus on the, on the niche. Um, yeah. Um, well, Trevor, you just wrote, you can definitely do it better, but you already started. Well, I know that. So we had this discussion, um, I think uh, in your BNI chapter, when we met first something, was in the Royal Automotive Club, I think so. And Bell, you also say that you research other healers so that you're competitive, exactly. So then when we want to surf on social media, as a medium, it goes to everywhere, but we really need to, need to drill it down. Uh, and that's an important, and here, Rachel, you add here, you focus on individually and the unique style. Yes, and you are unique in that way, I know. And that exactly has it a higher chance to create a tribe around you compared to you are average. So let's look what's there. And I see it from an angle of sales and marketing. So how to say these two different? I've been in marketing for many years. I've been in sales for many years. So for me, it's two sides of the same coin. Talking in black and white, marketing talks to an audience, sales talks to an individual. <laughs> Or some individuals or some stakeholders within it, but it's individual people. Marketing talks to an audience. The audience is a composition of individuals, of course, but first you need to get into a broader spectrum. So let's look into some terms 
if we know what we are talking about. So first of all, typically we talk words like lead generation or sales process and buying journey, all of these. So therefore, let's pay attention to how they all fit together. So a lead is someone who shows interest in what we do. Typically, there's a one-way communication. Uh, it's not yet a two-way because it's still a lead. It's, it's not yet a proper opportunity. So then uh, we also call it here, um, uh, it is first a marketing qualified lead. So if somebody only says, they, uh, let's say subscribe to a newsletter, it's nice, we have them, good, but we do not know yet if they really have an interest and if we can help them, which is a very, uh, very important uh, uh, topic. So I will just mute some of you for, for the most. So then the next one would be the sales qualified lead. Typically when we have a company who has marketing and sales people differently, so then of course we have the chance to, to work that out. That first marketing talk to them and finds out, now let's have someone talking closely about what they really want to have. If we are solopreneurs, we do this together after each other. And then there are the other terms like inbound versus outbound. So inbound would be what's just coming in and outbound would be, we do active research in our niche to, to find people. And typically we have to do somehow both. So finding people to become a lead is the first thing. And there's another term called ICA. Some of you might know that it comes from the marketing industry and that's the ideal customer avatar. And when I started creating online courses, um, I've been finding out which are the gurus who do that. And I found, um, uh, found one lady who I really liked, um, Amy Potterfield, and she described exactly her ideal custom avatar of people who want to create courses. And that is female and living in the US and earning from this to this and sick and tired of a nine to five job and then at an end. So that's her ICA. I'm absolutely not her ICA, but I really participated in her building a tribe where I feel well included. So not all of your leads are your ideal customer, but if you can describe one ideal customer, you can create three or four who are around that, who can be a little bit different. In my case, male in Australia, different type of areas, love my corporate job. I do not want to leave that, I want to do something in addition. So there might be deviations from this one, but it's so good to start and say, I want to focus on that niche and that's whom I can help. So when I talk about myself in regards to LinkedIn, social selling, working in the corporate space, mainly every day, I have a passion for small businesses, for those who you find in BNI meetings, for example. And these are the ones who I feel I can have them and I can transfer some of corporate knowledge into that one. So therefore, that's how I defined that uh, in my niche and went to a couple of BNIs. That's how I also uh, met with Trevor. So then the next topic here, when we talk from late, then let's get into a prospect. A prospect is basically when you validated someone in a two-way communication and they realized, yes, I can potentially help you. And then you are in the in this um, uh, next step in the funnel management, which comes later on the slide. And there are different ways, nurturing activities from a sales and marketing point of view, how to get them through. Many sales managers would say it's a sales process. I tend to say it's rather a customer buying journey, which is a different thing. And that customer buying journey means that it doesn't go in a linear way. Customers might have a different approach. Customers might say it's not linear. They go back and then they make a pause. Uh, and then for whatever trigger, they go again in it. So it's different. So then, and then we come to the funnel. There's different ways how to describe what the funnel is. What I don't like is to see it as a numbers game because in marketing, what they normally teach is some kind of conversion ratio. You need to have 1,000 people who are get in it. And then you can say, how many of them get through the stages to land one customer? But if I make, if I have a conversion rate of 5% from the very top of the funnel, might be great. But what happened to the other 95% of people who apparently made the decision 
not to use my services. That can happen. And it's so worse to also talk to them. So the funnel, um, how we describe them um, at Hootsuite has five steps. It's awareness, evaluation, acquisition, engagement, and advocacy, which is uh, often totally forgotten step number five, because there is the, the existing customers can be your raving fans. So instead of just saying I sold to them, we can really activate them. So that's these um, uh, employee advocacy type of uh, type of area, customer advocacy, who give you referrals. So we can see the funnel like this. Top of the funnel, which typically is marketing. From there you get leads. Then you have the middle of the funnel. Then you get them through the journey to become a process. And at the end, when they become customers, then we can serve them. And those customers can bring people into the top of the funnel from a referral, from describing how happy they are. Where can they describe this? Social media. So that is a whole funnel management. And I'm actually preparing an online course about the whole thing, not just social media, but rather your online business, social and digital. So, but how can we research the competition in our niche? So there's, in my view, is four to five channels that make sense to work through. Number four, I don't talk today, would be Instagram. Number five would be Twitter. Hmm. Very often unrelated. So, um, Philip, you just say, and um, happy to, uh, to always um, get into the question here. From a business perspective, do you only consider true customers as paying customers? Well, sometimes you might have customers who you help for a return, which is not necessarily in a monetary way. You can help some if you are starting expanding your niche, for example, and you would like to get testimonials. Um, so that can happen as well. They do not necessarily need to be paying customers. But if you are in a not-for-profit sector, that exists even more often, that you can help them, they are happy, and there's other ways of um, how you can gain a return. So it's not necessarily only, uh, only paying ones. So how can we search? We can search on Google, logically. Um, so imagine we would be network marketing professionals looking for them in Sydney. So then somehow um, some of us, uh, Rachel, um, you and I for sure, we are somewhere in this, in this industry to find people. And there's different areas. The first thing for me, I go to Google and figure it out. And what you get there are typical sources like Meetup or even Eventbrite you can see here which are quite obvious areas um, where people are hanging out. They can find how others run events, how others have um, kind of institutions, organizations where they are going to. In this first example here, you can see the Sydney Business Networking Group is one of those, for example, and there's plenty of others. And if you tap into one area, so when I came to Australia, I looked into, um, uh, into, uh, into BNI, Business Network International, where we're maybe 16 chapters in Sydney CBD and more around, tapping into one, and then you learn how the whole area works and where maybe also some of your competitors hang out and you can build relationship. The second one, after Google, you can look into Facebook. There's one funny thing between all of the social media channels. There are many people there who want to offer something let's call it sell something, but it's difficult to find out people who say actively what they're looking for. So imagine we take someone who is a healer, take Bell for example. Nobody says that they need a Reiki healer on Facebook or even LinkedIn. They don't even say they have back pain. They don't say that. But you can figure out if someone is in the market for IT systems. You can find that out. We can find out somebody uh, who's in leadership area. There's different niches have a higher likelihood of a prospect sharing a need. In Facebook, on the other side, you can also drill down your searches with demographics and very deep down, and you can pay a bit of money to place an advertising for a very clear demographic. For example, um, Rachel, you will look for someone just thinking about, uh, because we have a finance background. Imagine you would like to know some finance planners who are on the South Island of New Zealand, 
in, maybe, maybe in Dunedin, in Christchurch, and um, in Inverkagel. You can really go and drill it down so much on Facebook, and then you can get some who are in that area. That's good. And then you can engage and place something to them, uh, I, either a boosted post or on advertising, and then you can get engagement from those type of people. That's good. Uh, LinkedIn doesn't have that. That goes a bit different. So channel one, Google. Find your niche and find out how you describe yourself in it. Do you fit in there? But do we actually want that? Do we want to be the same of the same? No. We would like to stand out. But we should not stand out too much. Whenever I went to an BNI chapter, so I, I often talk to the electrician and to the plumber. Because if we need them, then we need them for exactly that. Because what they are. If they say we are diversifying, we also do this or that, then it might be a little bit of um, confusing. So I need to be just, I need an electrician who knows a good guy and who helps me with plumbing needs. So then getting too off is not good, but describe exactly to fit the niche is important. Let's look into channel three, my favorite one, which is LinkedIn. Don't talk Instagram, and that sent us closer to Facebook, and Twitter is a different thing. So if we run a search, and here I've been looking into, uh, into network marketing, as you can see. So there are some people here uh, where the word network sits in, but we need to pay attention on LinkedIn because some words have different meanings. Like network can be uh, cables, IT network type of stuff. Network can be um, uh, network marketing uh, products like Mway, whatever it is, but you can find them. So then you can get into also one of the critical things here. If you look into the green bars, I look only in Sydney and I look only second grade connections. And that works because I have a large network of first grade. If somebody of you would do the same search, let me say, Chintia, maybe you, you would run exactly the same. Search for network marketing, put it to Sydney and second grade. You might not get 17,000 results, but potentially less because your network is a bit smaller than mine. It doesn't, so uh, doesn't mean that I have a large one, but maybe I have also a relevant network into, into this type of area. So the basic search gets us that far, and then the advanced search gets an even a bit further and we can add more filters to it. That's a good one. Funny, it's then when we say, can I also from LinkedIn get phone numbers to call them or email addresses because not everyone puts it on. And what you see on this screen here, you see on the right hand side, a little illustration with a purple background from a Russian grandmother. That is a plugin of LinkedIn that I have is called Lucia. And Lucia is a way where I can gain um, more details about a person. That's a funny one. Maybe a phone number, maybe an email address, whatever it is. Uh, cost maybe a little bit, handful of dollars per month, but uh, many corporate people take this, use this in order to find out uh, connections. So that at least is about the um, research of competition. So I described the niche as good as possible in a sense of, since you would say um, uh, in your niche uh, as uh, somebody who provides beautician services coming to the house of the people, your area would be in, in Lower North Shore and Northern Beach, something like that. And then you can try to find out people around there. On LinkedIn, they do not say, I have a need for something. That makes it very tricky. It's not a bidding machine. It is not like Airtasker, which is uh, where you could find somebody says, I need someone who creates an illustration for a book. And then of course, all those can, su can submit a bit, of course, but that's a different thing. Um, when you ask, uh, we, I go over the difference of search on Google method as opposed to Facebook. The difference being in Google, I go extremely broad and try to find networks, try to find associations, institutions, um, something like a Mossman Business Chamber uh, or um, depending on the niche, 
there is something. So when I've been in risk management, I look into um, into 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 risk management institutions. When I've been in leadership, I look into the Australian Institute of Management. I look into Institute of Managers and Leaders, and also uh, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, who all is part of associations in ever in whatever form that you find in Google the best way. Then uh, then you find out which they are. And then you go into LinkedIn to find more about these type of institutions. So combining all of these tools makes sense. Be clear on the niche. And then when we know, okay, that is our niche that we would like to serve, that we get ourselves used to this. We apparently we come across some kind of people who are active there. And then we would like to also um, enhance our network but I ask you to do this as target as possible. I'll show you how not to do. Two years ago, I wanted to test something. And there was a time just end of bushfire season uh, when people started to put out a process. Let's increase our followers. Simple process like this post, if you agree, watch the profiles of all who engage, connect with everyone. And then you had thousands of views, lots of, likes and comments you can see here, plenty of, but have they been targeted? Not at all. And there's some masters who have done this, like Shane uh, and my ex HP colleague, Ira Bowman, who do this and they have hundreds of thousands of followers. And you have the feeling their content is great, they hit it, but it's not targeted. It's not focused on the niche. What should I do when I have 10,000 hairdressers in my network, but I don't talk about that. Makes no sense. And some people like here, Kaiser, he's an expert on doing this as well. He actually tagged me today in a similar approach as well. If I want to get more people in my network, I jump on this thing. If I want to have targeted for my niche, I don't do this stuff. We do not need quantity of people. We do not need just quality of people. We need quantity of quality, meaning a high density. I better have just 10,000 than 100,000 followers on LinkedIn, but those 10,000 have a high likelihood to engage. So be a genuine networker. Don't go for the masses. So I'll show you an example what you also need to have there. So then here is the, when you realize you would like to go for, um, uh, for the uh, um, to get out and connect with people and research about them. What happens is the people would also then look who you are. So you do this when you already have your own profile uh, on brand. So here's an example uh, from Sue Larkin. She's a glasses uh, trainer uh, here in Sydney. Uh, thanks to Belle, I, I, I know her. So then that's good. And then we created exactly this. So when you look at this, particularly in the area of health and fitness and beauty, many people don't have that great LinkedIn profile. You can stand out. And it should be quite easily recognizable. Which service do you provide? How do you deliver your unique selling proposition? And look at the headline. So we agreed on not only that she's an owner of her organization, but she also added a slogan, feel good about yourself. And we put that even into this picture in Canva. So on the profile should be clear, who do you serve in which niche? Who do you partner with if partnership is an important thing? Like um, somebody in, in healing, energy healing could potentially partner up with someone who does other services um, like a physiotherapist or something like that to share rooms or whatever. So then sometimes it's good to partner with someone. Um, what are the personal values? And then utilize LinkedIn, same Facebook for the same thing as well, as a kind of a standardized landing page. Every homepage looks different. But LinkedIn, similar to Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, they are standardized. We all know what's written where, and that makes it a big, big advantage. Um, so find, how to get find. So now question to you to all of you, where do you find your clients 
outside of LinkedIn. Question, keen on that. Where do you find your clients outside of LinkedIn? So where normally you get there? And can we simulate this here? So in my case, uh, networking events. Uh, also Trevor sent for you in a positive sense, uh, networking and referrals. Referrals is a good one. Um, where else do you find? Uh, social media, Bridget, good one. Uh, Bridget, to get it further, where on social media? More on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Yeah, and Rachel, your personal networks. So that's that's good one. Yeah, um, well, of course, it's, it's you say it's the hardest part and challenging. There's Facebook events like Meetup, Notice Boards, Friends of Friends, Instagram. It's uh, quite overwhelming in time. Huh? Then you have the feeling there's so much ongoing, so much noise, and so on. So that makes it quite uh, difficult. So let's look into this one, how we can actually find people. Instagram, which is a good one. Yeah. Projects uh, on this depends on the niche, depends on the area. So um, even if you would have 100 people on the call today, I think nobody would put their Twitter. I'm, I'm, I'm re, um, how to say this? I'm, I'm re-recognizing Twitter as a great one. So that's, uh, that happens. So ideal members of your tribe and not just customers. It's good to have customers there, no doubt. And uh, Trevor, as you mentioned, referrals come from happy clients, logically. Therefore, referral testimonials are good. So I know one coach in the sales area who has about 278 recommendations on LinkedIn. That sounds a lot. Typical people have maybe five to 10, but he asked everyone to put a, um, put a referral testimonial in, in LinkedIn. So that's hard to stand out. Um, but yeah, what uh, Rachel, do you write? Um, relationship must be solid with people in order to reach out. Yeah, build and creating good relationship and people will want to listen. Social media can help. I bet Rachel, your network is not only in the needle, not at all, you go much wider, but you can build general relationships here. So customers, first one, prospects, second one that we need to have, those who can be our future customers. When we describe our niche well, when we know what we can offer, when we have our LinkedIn profile in order, same for Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, then we can actively prospect people who then are our prospects. So then the third one are suppliers, solution partners. So then for example, if I would want to, um, uh, let me find, an, find, uh, find, find a way. So if I would like to, run an event about social media, I might not want to be the only speaker of a two hour event. I might want to invite someone. I've done this on a, on a webinar one and a half years ago with, uh, with Victor who has a meetup group about networking. And I have a meetup group about social selling. So of course we partnered together because I can tap into his network. He can tap into my network. We share that and that's good. Rachel, you and Sabi, you work in a similar way. So then, your solution partners, not just the word supplier, which looks like uh, the one who's delivering the potatoes to Woolies. So these three are very important. Let's find some three others. Supporters, adjacent professionals around you who also ideally have um, something in that area connected. So for example, here on this picture, you can see me a little bit in the middle and right for me is a gentleman, or two actually, both gentlemen, they have large networks of around 12,000 plus people on LinkedIn, both in IT like myself. So of course we can help and support each other because there is surely a good person in our network who can help the other, the other one. Uh, Philip, you asked a question here. Can the business name be used as a profile on LinkedIn rather than as an individual? Um, technically it can, but should not. You have two different things on LinkedIn. You can have, let me show you. Just jumping here quickly because the question is a good one. This picture here from Sue, the picture 
is that's a personal profile and it is rounded the picture around her the uh, the, the the shape is rounded because typically the head of a human is rounded they are linked in pages not profile but pages and that is square because a building is more likely rectangular than rounded so that's how they create the difference so you, you can have as person exactly one profile like sue has but she has a page as well this green one there written pilates for well-being so that is her page that's the business side of it there's two different things there's two different functions and two different way how engagement is possible so getting back from the supporters to get into uh, influencers um, of course the word is very often used for those in instagram who go and traveling the world like this one which is a uh, uh, Nicola from, from New Zealand in my hometown in Zurich. And I love her travel blogs and she's one of these type of influencers, but I mean rather expert from industry associations. So when I mentioned before, I had the Institute of Company Directors. If I'm in the area of leadership training, I should know some stakeholders there. Then beforehand I've been in, um, in risk management, I should know people in those organizations. These type of, these for me are influencers who are, or maybe even university professors in an area where they are with their own research talking and uh, having good statements around that. These are the influencers you, we should be close to. We need to have them in our network and engage with them. And the last, the last one here are market companions. Let's call it competitors. And Trevor, when you go to your BNI profile as BNI chapter. Sometimes you might visit another BNI chapter, and someone else in that chapter does something similar to what you are doing. And of course, you build network with those people as well. And you want to see what they are doing in order to stand out to figure out if it's going well. Um, so um, let's go further. So the ID members of the tribe was the six different type of levels. That we had uh, beforehand clients, prospects, suppliers, supporters, influencers, and competitors. But how can we find them? So, sources for the tribe. Um, yeah, and actually, Trevor, you mentioned collaboration opportunities often occur as a visitor for one chapter. You might even bring business to them because your network has it. So, that's a good thing about it. Um, then, uh, Bell, um, and uh, uh, second by Rachel about uh, how we may engage and build up clients from Facebook when other people follow you. It's a similar thing here in general. These type of six areas that I showed beforehand, we need to have regardless the channel. So Facebook, similar thing. I would like to have also to find out who are suppliers there, who are influencers there, and so on. So a similar type of area. But then um, when they follow us, then of course we can engage with them. So I recently went through my Instagram followers. I had maybe, I don't know, 1,000 or so. But there were many people who I don't want to even have in my network. They would share something which is not relevant to my network and I cannot help them. So I kicked out 300 of them. So they are paying a lot of attention. What is the difference from these channels? In LinkedIn, everyone can follow another person. It's not a problem. You can have as many as you like but you can only have 30,000 connections. When you have that, then it's full, then you can only be followed. Facebook, everyone can send you a request, but you, a friend request, but you can only have 5,000 friends, but you can have more followers, obviously. You can kick them out as a friend, you can close a friendship, but they can still be your followers. So these are how the two are a little bit uh, different by the numbers. So where do we find them, particularly on LinkedIn? Who viewed your profile? Hmm. You can find that out and I'll show you on the slide. Content engagement. If you bring out good material, then in particular when that material is above standard, I remember the day, Trevor, when you started to put out videos. Good, great, I saw this. It came to my network. I happily engaged with it. Um, you can look in the feed what's in there. 
the more you engage with people, the more you get their stuff in the feed, the more you and the more you like something which is not relevant to you, the more you get this irrelevant stuff. So it's your own way how to do it. And you have your followers. Maybe it's time to look who follows you so that then you could engage with them and find out, hey, thank you for following. Uh, keen to know what, what you thought about this or that, what I shared or about what, what they do, you can reach out to them. Second great connection, that's good. If I wanted to find out who is um, the IT reseller or IT guy in a BNI chapter, then I would say, Trevor, please, could you please introduce me to your IT guy? And then I go and build a relationship with them. And I went to another BNI chapter and I've done the same thing. And that's how I got into 20 IT reseller. And this was my target market. I went, I've done a nice tour through all of the different BNIs uh, four years ago. Lovely. Because these people, for me, were the second grade behind Trevor. And when I got them, their clients could have been my clients. So the second grade connections are very important. There's also something called LinkedIn groups. Uh, not everyone is that active on it, but I really, really like them. LinkedIn groups are often older than Facebook groups and less active, but people don't leave them. And when we talked about having focus on your niche, and imagine my niece would have been still risk management. There's so many groups about that. People don't leave that and people don't necessarily change the industry too much, particularly not in these specific niches. So then connect with them, talk to them, write something in the group, get awareness for that. That's how you find people. That's how you find ideas for content, which gets you sources for your tribe. And there is this field, people also use, I'll show you in a later slide. It was online and offline. With everything opening up and hopefully not closing soon. Um, uh, attended again meetings, lovely. Go to events, conventions, of course, replaced with Zoom. Uh, or in addition to this, we can always have a chance to meet people there. Getting hints from office colleagues. I remember then when Someone asked me who has been doing this or who was it that we talked about for something. So then ask people around you. There was somebody, I remember we went to that event. Who was that? Somebody knows it. Ask neighbors, friends, other social engagement, go to meetup events. Find out um, if meetup events serve a similar type of niche. Not just of customers, but people who could be quite similar. And that's how you build it. There yeah, even LinkedIn has this function called find nearby, which is currently switched off during the pandemic, not to mingle too much, or the QR code, which makes it easy. If you go somewhere, you would like to connect with someone, LinkedIn has a QR code, which is actually sitting in the, um, in the, in the search bar. And you can show one person shows the code, the other one scans the code, easy thing. So who viewed your profile? That is a function from LinkedIn Premium, which shows up to 90 days. And for those who don't have LinkedIn Premium, they have only the five last people. So it's worth at least once per year to have LinkedIn Premium, which is only, which is free for 30 days. Or maybe you go for next month and then cost just $39.99 at the cheapest premium, Australian dollars. So what I got here, I changed, that was a bit a while ago, that was my typical profile viewers. The amount you can see is toggling between 60 and maybe 100. And then by end of October, I started changing my content approach. I moved to cybersecurity, uh, my content, and I added different hashtags. And I had the chance to have more people who wanted to, uh, who viewed actually my profile. That was perfect. So I could really go Below this graph is a list of everyone who viewed my profile in the 90 days. Typical thing in this list, and not connect with the people, not at all, but right click on each of every person into a new tab, watch their profile, use a template for um, something like, hi, name, thanks for watching my profile, appreciate. I see we have these and that in common. It would be great 
to connect with you and then keen to learn more what you are up to, what you're sharing, whatever. doesn't matter. So I have a list of um, uh, connection templates in my course uh, and that's what I use. And therefore I could enhance my networks from maybe 800 when I came to Australia five years ago to 7,790. Yeah, over here. So that's good constantly. So who viewed your profile is important. Can we do this in other social media networks as well? Not too much in the same way, not with the same type of detail. So that's a good thing about it. Yeah, so then uh, what here, value you write, uh, LinkedIn is only intended to make connections with second rate connections. Yes, that's a good one. So, but let's get broader. So how to find other members when it's not always so easy? Why doesn't LinkedIn help us? Because those who connect with us might not be our customers or might not even fit into these six categories. So then background here, not always easy to find. And it looks like you don't see the trees in the forest. You need to have some fresh ideas. And LinkedIn gives it to us. So if you go on a LinkedIn profile with all the stuff about the person, then on the right-hand side from that is a little kind of window. And there's written people also viewed. Think like Amazon, where it's written people who bought this or who bought that. That's good. So in most of the time when I looked at it, there are 10 people in it. And these people also viewed. It's changing every month or so. And out of the 10 people, I have typically six who are just my second grade and four are my first grade connections. So that's when I took these uh, screenshots here in the year 2020 early, then you can see six people are not my first grades, but myself being a sales trainer and a sales manager, in that sense, many of them are very, very relevant. And that's, that, that's really outstanding. So this is how the algorithm of LinkedIn helps. It's good. But of course, if I wanted to simply say, go on the profile of Jeb Blunt and press on the connect button, he might not want that because he has already 100,000 plus followers. Maybe his connects are already ex expanded. So then to those people which are suggested, we really need to have a personal introduction or maybe even someone who could introduce us. If I would see that Jeb Blunt, for example, is um, as he is a CEO at Sales Gravy, he is an author, he wrote a couple of books and courses, then I would maybe ask someone in the same area who I know well, uh, like John Smybert, some of equivalent here, I would say, hey, John, you know Jeb, could you please uh, be so kind and introduce me to him? And he would happily do so. So that's a good thing. Second grade, not just to connect directly, but consider an introduction. So let's get the next one. Follow up. Question to the audience. Too often do you follow up your new prospects? Imagine you have someone who gets into your network as a new prospect. Some prospect means it's not just a lead, but you already had one conversation. Do the finger out, potentially they, you can do business with them, whatever niche, whatever uh, offers you have. How do you follow up? And for example, uh, mainly how often do you follow up? So in my case, follow up of two to four days, two different channels. So Trevor, at least with an email message on LinkedIn after connecting, not the sales pitch though, well done. So often I get emails from people, emails, of course, but also LinkedIn outreach and more and more WhatsApp and Instagram. There's something like we are a provider of nails in China. We're happy to send you 100,000 of nails. I mean, I don't, I don't sell hammers, so I don't need nails. So then totally not targeted. So therefore that, that I really do not do not know. Um, so what else? Um, what we have, not on LinkedIn, you don't follow up on LinkedIn, Bridget. 
Yeah, I mean, if your focus is on Instagram, the question would be then there if you know that the same person is also on LinkedIn. Um, very often people have connect two ways, either two social media channels or uh, LinkedIn plus email uh, or even Facebook plus phone, whatever it is, but it makes sense to, to combine more. Uh, so that's that's important uh, important topic. So how to follow up, how often to follow up, and which type of channels. Um, there is one good book which came out in early 18, I think, from Tony Youth, um, one of the best Australian sales book authors, They're called Combo Prospecting. And he has there a picture of a boxer who is using two ways into hitting his customer, so to say, as an allegory. And that's the idea to not go the same way. So if you try to send an email and you send every second day an email and always the same thing, um, might not be enough. So you need to have a cadence which includes a different type of outreach. Um, you could send even a personal letter if you have the address, I've done that. That was nice. Uh, people don't get letters too often or maybe put out a phone call, finding out a good time for that. Maybe when the people walk their dog or something like that. So that, that's good. So then here, Rachel, you say, uh, you schedule a time to follow up when showing an opportunity, usually two days. Message first, then call on Zoom. It's, it's a good approach here. You have a plan for that in place, but also you message first to ask for a call. You want to earn the call. And that's what I like. Um, because some people really try to call straight away, but not always possible. So then then you say, you follow up with clients using channel that they need me. Your messaging is sometimes phone call. Yeah, mix this, it's good. But also follow up and try to put it in a good, um, in a good approach. If you go too often, then it looks like um, overdoing this. That puts many people at, uh, rather afraid of it. And you need to learn what makes a person also click? What is their trigger event? So particularly when you have something where they have, where they need to make a decision on something to invest rather, which has an annual price. For example, if uh, someone would, would sell something which is a monthly recurring type of invoice. Um, imagine I would be the IT guy selling Office 365, which is $10 a month. Okay, then I understand if a customer doesn't take it now, okay, maybe in the next month. But if, if I'm about um, to say something a bit more expensive and that uh, is based on their financial circumstances, maybe fitting into tax season, fitting into end of financial year, budget availability, it's a different thing. If well, when you go in terms of healing activity and you know a person has pain, then you should not waste too long time with following up because otherwise the pain goes away naturally as well. I wanted to go to, to a specialist for my ear uh, about a week ago and I realized simply I didn't even find the time to get to my GP to get for a referral to a specialist and it's now done. Don't need it anymore. So bad luck for, for that doctor, but can happen as well. So finding the right balance of the channels two or three and the cadence, uh, how often to do that, that's important. So next is then use commenting to win engagement on LinkedIn. So one way to follow up is not straight calling or messaging, but rather silently knock on the door to make them aware of, ah, oh, yeah, I want to do that back to the, to the provider. And one underrated strategy is commenting on content. So I could say, I post something. Maybe my prospect is seeing this. Maybe I won't even to tag them. Maybe I better don't tag them because I do not want the prospect to know that we have potential business deal, but then I share them a post. Or they do something and I, I comment on it. And you can multiply this. You can simply say, you can share something, tag someone, send the post to those who will comment it to tap into their networks. If I want someone to buy my service and the person says he doesn't have money for that available, then I look into 
how that person is actually earning money. Can I get that person more clients to earn more money in order to afford my service? So that's the way of thinking. Think of the customers of your prospect, of their end customers. Multiply and then you can grow, you can reply to the comments. And uh, therefore, in my view, commenting helps to win engagement, to gain followers. To, to make them raving fans. That is one of the options. I show you an example. This here was one of my social selling posts I've done last year. Where can you find suitable contacts for your network without even searching for them? So that's basically also what we talk about. It four tips as usual. And then I added the picture of a person who back then has been my prospect of, uh, he's a consultant on social media. I didn't sign a contract back then, nothing like this, but it helped adding him in there two months after we met. And then he started even to comment because he understands that. And we built a relationship only on LinkedIn. And one day he wondered, hey Gunnar, but apparently my offer doesn't resonate. But simply because I was missing the trigger by myself. And then there was a moment half a year after this post, in April, I called him and said, hey, Roger, what you all talked back then, I now have exactly that trigger event that I might need your service. We signed an agreement, we got a customer, and that, uh, that's uh, how that, and then we even got the next one. So then finally, the trust started to be built completely on LinkedIn after one physical meeting. Everything rest was then only that. It really works. Following up, do this every now and then, like, like something from them and so on until the trigger event is there. So I learned one thing. If you take a journey of a customer, in 97% along the journey, the customer is not ready to buy, only in the last 3%. So the 97, we need to nurture them without going on their nerves, but so that they, they remember us when they need something. That's the thing. So how to follow up quickly? So, uh, um, oh, well, you're right. Uh, I keep liking his post. Yeah, of course. I started liking his post. I actually shared some of his content as well to my colleagues. So, hey, look what he wrote about that client who you serve as well can be good. So, we multiplied these posts together. Yes. And I got nice socks from him for Christmas as a gift. Love that. So, um, with his logo, his company. Funny one, you also have good ones. So follow up quickly, time matters. So what happens, you post great content, but then you do different things. You don't do follow up, there's no checkpoint. Then of course we miss that. So the, the only way how you can do this um, is schedule dedicated time at the end of the day, for example. I personally do it morning and evening, not too much about lunchtime and comment on the post and connect those that we like. It shows us we're active and responsive and increasing engagement while it's fresh. Here's an example, there's a couple of people who I know, who some of you know as well. A lot of, they reply, I reply. They comment, I reply to the comment and so on. So that, that's an important thing, time matters. Don't leave it too long because otherwise nothing is as old as social media from yesterday. And there's a couple of do's and don'ts if you want. Before I had one question here from the chat, is sharing other people's content a good way to build up a relationship? Oh, yes. I get you an example. I want you to tap into the network of a risk management consultant in the cybersecurity space, very specialized, large network. Typically, I could press on connect. But why should I do that? When at the same time, I can take some of his material get it into my network. I got some 11,000 views, plenty of comments, and he connected with me instead of me connecting with him. So that's, um, that's uh, the way we like with the dog and the, and, uh, and the bones to eat. So that's a good one. So do's and don'ts. Typically people post something and forget about it. Better nurture and follow up. Because when you build a relationship with someone, and you want them to buy your service and they're active on LinkedIn in their area, be close to them. It's good. 
Don't talk only about you and your products. That makes no sense. Rather ask questions and educate the audience. That's good. That's when you are in your niche, make yourself available in the niche. Share something there. Not as two short posts without value, but rather value to the challenges, answer challenges that they have without pitching. That's a fine line on it. Don't comment with one line, but rather show your capability to write. Not add more than five hashtags, but rather just three to five. It helps. Take everyone inside the post. Not, but rather add a comment and take people there. Then you have more space for the content itself. Don't use automation software to connect with hundreds of people and endorse people for everything because it's not genuine. Rather work organically. For example, in a time of the year end, if you would like to reconnect with some people because of change in your focus or more focusing on your niche, find out who would be the people there you might know them when you're first grade connected. Why not endorsing them for something? It's Christmas time, it's giving. Why not say, yes, Trevor is good who does this or this. I tick five or 10 of his boxes. It's nice. And then he gets a message. He could then press on one button to say, oh, I'm gonna thank you for the endorsements. And that is built another reason to talk and to chat. And that moment, Trevor thinks about the relationship that we have, how maybe I can help him or he can help me. Getting that is therefore also the birthday wishes are good. Um, we have eight o'clock. Do you have some more minutes? I would like to, I prepared something particular, uh, what I thought might be quite helpful. And I know there was a lot of content we went through already. Um, so I would like to share with you something about how LinkedIn actually works. Not sure if I ever had that in the, in the webinar. So there's one expert uh, LinkedIn trainer called Richard van der Boom, he's Dutch, and he put in September huge research how the algorithm works. So if you post, your post will quickly be checked by the artificial intelligence of LinkedIn. And then it's shown to a small test group of eight to 10% of your connections. Then the reaction of those people, and nobody knows who they are, in the first two hours count. If you post at midnight and your audience start be on LinkedIn again next morning at 9 a.m., they don't see it anymore. So therefore, engagement counts, and that's an, that's an important one. So um, comments. You know, people like to press on the word like, but if you provide a comment, it's seven times more powerful and getting a like you give in the first two hours and it's four times at least after the first two hours so a comment has much more weight than a like how can we get comments write posts so that is enticing people to reply to put out a comment dressing that's rather my word use three to hashtags and less than 10 emojis that's also what he says which I says pressing the see more you know, when you start writing in the feed, you have only the first three lines and the third line has the words of see more. If somebody press this, it does more for your content compared to someone press on like. That's important. The first three lines really count. Polls, maybe you have seen plenty of polls lately. Uh, the more you participate, the more you get and they help to get 450% of more reach than a regular post with one picture. Document posts, these are the ones where you have more pictures, uh, or let's say documents uh, like a PDF that you can scroll through. Um, they're 250% more reach, multiple picture posts, 150 more. A lot, that's good. Video is less compared to last year. There was too much video on LinkedIn. It's happy for that. But we'll come back when LinkedIn thought about what they can do against TikTok. That's the social selling index, um, linkedin.com slash sales SSI. If you are above 60, you have 10% more reach. Mm -hmm. Good one. And finally, internal engagement. 
up to 25% less reach. So if I share something and I get five comments from my colleagues in the same company, that doesn't count as much as all of you providing the same number of comments, not to forget. So where to find that? When you get the slides for these uh, from today, here's the link, click on it, then you get all the details for the report. Big research, and this is these are my highlights. So also, I might add into the uh, post, I gave the tips for a book, which is Combo Prospecting from, from Tony uh, Jayu. So happy to add that uh, in the minutes as well. So that's from my side. If you have any questions, please write them here while I would like to guide you um, over the last little tiny few minutes and we actually get over time, um, but that's fine. So, well, I recognize that many LinkedIn challenge, many small businesses have LinkedIn challenges and you might find yourself here as well. Many are overcautious not really connecting too much, unclear. Many are overwhelmed, you get too much. And they're overthinking it, how to really do this, pause by perfectionism, unclear how to convert followers, listening too much without doing action, not good. So I'm happy to help. How do I do this? So then what I do typically, I start with a discovery call. I cannot help without knowing um, what are the pain points like when you go to, to the doctor and then I can help like on the example of the profile picture that I shared from Sue so then we went to a profile refresh to figure out to turn her profile from a CV style into a, um, into a storytelling approach and I can do this to provide advisory or completely write it so there are different type of versions for that one and also I have my LinkedIn course um, which is about 60 lessons and that enhances your knowledge about so these are the three areas what how I can help. It's all tailored for small businesses and not for the corporate sector. So the LinkedIn course itself has four areas, uh, how to complete uh, what you're doing, how to connect well, how the content uh, should be done in terms of commenting, creating, creating, and then also how to convert further. And uh, there's a little bit of a cabinet with lots of tools and further recording and um, um, templates and so on. And you can see I have a big passion for all of the C's over here. And it's quite affordable. Uh, I think uh, $97 is not too much for a course where you have evergreen content on it and it's, uh, all pre-recorded, so that's good. Um, then how to make that happen? So typically you would, uh, there's two-step approach. So you could say, I would like to learn more about it. So step one would be to, to take the course. And then you realize, mm, my profile needs more help. I can help on the profile refresh. So I'm going the other way around. So that, and uh, you might add a discovery call at the beginning. So at the end, you have two calls with me, which is good. And now having the end of year period, uh, then it goes like, like this, I think. For, um, Christmas and giving and preparing for the next year. I thought for, for every, uh, everyone who is then joining um, the LinkedIn profile refresh, I'm happy to get the course for free until the end of this year. So then uh, that is my offer that is valid. Let's put it forward for two weeks, like before the Monday uh, of next year when it goes on again. So that I think it's quite good that you have the chance look into how to work LinkedIn properly in the course, but also I help you on the refresh of your profile to make that better, stronger, ready for 2022. So this is an offering that I will put on. Um, and that includes this 45 minutes mentoring call to really get deep down into and writing some portions by myself. So the free thing is you get the course for free if you uh, buy the profile refresh. So that's, that's how that works. So it's basically it's like a 33% uh, of discount. Questions here came, uh, will you go over what you said about like and comment difference for post to be like? Yeah, a comment has more value than a like. Within the likes, you see there are also some other symbols. 
both Facebook and LinkedIn, they work in the way that the normal blue light is okay. But if you put a heart on Facebook, and Rachel, I know you do this, uh, this heart is not necessary to express unconditional love, but actually it works better for the algorithm. So a post is higher valued the more hearts you get compared to the regular uh, blue like button. Uh, yes, you confirm, yeah, you know that. Uh, and um, a comment has even more value across all platforms. For getting comments is what we want. And, our, and there's even a way when you comment something nicely, you comment someone else's post or someone else's comment, LinkedIn sometimes finds it so good that it takes that and suggests you can make a post out of this one. So really right to play uh, content. Yeah, so then these are, these are the way how that works. Um, in LinkedIn, we have as well different type of symbols, not exactly the same, but we have right for support, for example, for curiosity, different type of areas. Uh, but in Facebook is very strong on this one with the hearts as well. Have a look how others are doing this, so that really, really makes sense. So that's all what I wanted to share with you today. You will receive typically 12 hours after the call started and an email for all who registered where you get the slides, where you get the recording. Um, and uh, that way you can go through some of the material as well, because I talked a lot about the details, I have some links like this one here for the course. And particularly this slide with all of the algorithm stuff has a lot in it, including a link where you would get more about it. And to the last question here, the symbols mean more in Facebook than in LinkedIn. Would not necessarily say so. I think it's equally um, in the algorithm, plus minus at least. The exact uh, science is changing every day. But fact is, if you try to be as genuine yourself compared to standard that helps as a general principle. That makes sense. Good. Thank you also, Rachel, for confirming that. So that's very good. And um, then I would like to go to the closing slide. If any further questions, please ask. Please ask afterwards. Send me an email. Find me on in my Facebook group here, on my on my website, on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm everywhere. And uh, thank you, Bridget, as well. That's very kind. Uh, Sean as well, uh, Olin, thanks for joining as well. Um, so that's good. And then if nothing else further, I'm very happy to close the call and start putting the recording onto the website, linkedinpowerlab.com. Thank you, Gunnar. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, see you on Friday. Yes, sir. <laughs> sure. Thank you Thanks. very much, Gunnar. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Yes. Bye, everyone.